Neurolaryngology is an absolutely fascinating part of laryngology. It's one of the foundations of laryngology. And despite that, it's something that is looked at often very superficially. But almost any practice that has a few of the typical tools for looking at the vocal cords will have what they need to explore and visualize what the nerves are doing. Now you can't see the nerves, their nerves are in the neck, but the nerves effectively supply a muscle. So neurolaryngology is looking at the movement of muscles and you can visualize each of those muscles. Now that sounds easy and a lot of patients are told they have a paralyzed vocal cord or if they don't. And that's the simple part of it. That is people tend to think of Neurolaryngology is a binary on or off. That is the nerves working or it's not working. But perhaps it isn't that simple. Let's start out by thinking about the muscles in the larynx. We have the thyroretinoid muscle, one in each vocal cord. We have the lateral cricorytenoid muscle that closes each vocal cord. We have the posterior cricorytenoid muscle on each side that opens each vocal cord. We have the interarytenoid muscle that holds them closed once they have come together. And we have the cricothyroid muscle that stretches them longer. If we add them all up, it's at least nine different muscles because some of them are bilateral. And if we have nine muscles that could either be working or not working, the number of possible configurations would be nine squared, or we'd have 80 different configurations of the larynx. But neurolaryngology isn't quite that simple. That is, maybe a nerve is only partway injured. So we now have a state where the muscle's not working because the nerve is completely cut or injured. We have the normal condition where it, the muscle can contract. And we have some condition in between where the muscle can only contract partway because it doesn't have complete nerve input. So now we have three possible configurations for each of the nine muscles. So we have nine cubed. We have almost 730 possible configurations to the larynx. But even that's an oversimplification because the nerves to the larynx are so robust that after they're injured, they almost always regrow. But when they regrow, they may go to a different muscle. They may go to the wrong muscle. And what happens then? Well, your brain is, wants to tell your vocal cord, say your larynx to close. So it sends a message to the lateral cricorytenoid muscle to close. But instead, some of those nerve fibers, let's say they go to the posterior cricorytenoid muscle. And so when you go to talk, maybe it fires at the wrong time. That is, it fires during the breathing cycle at, or it fires and energizes the breathing muscle. And so you have the a muscle firing when it shouldn't. So now you have four different states. The muscle doesn't work, the muscle works normally, the muscle works part way, or the muscle works part way or normally when it shouldn't be firing at all. So now we've got nine muscles to the fourth power and we have close to 7,000 different possible configurations of the larynx. So it does get complex pretty quick, but that's not really a reason to ignore the complexity. It's a, a reason for an individual who's examining and diagnosing a problem to be very precise about whether a muscle activates or not, to focus only on a single muscle and see if it fires when it should or if it fires when it shouldn't. And can it contract completely or only part way? So the way to simplify neurolaryngology is to use an endoscope and go in and record it and then look at each muscle's function and see if it's working on time. And so if you make a recording of the larynx, you'll be able to go over it and isolate first one muscle and then another and then another and then another. And that way you'll be able to figure out what's going on. So that's what makes neurolaryngology truly fascinating. There are really 
many, many combinations, but there are some common configurations. And because the examiner who is astute can isolate them, you can figure out what's going on in an injured or an injured and recovering larynx. Allow me to introduce a graphical representation of the recurrent laryngeal nerve that we'll utilize to try and understand what goes on in the nerve when there's an injury and compare that to what we see with an endoscope. I've drawn a little graphic meant to represent the recurrent laryngeal nerve with three bundles of fibers. The PCA, the posterior cricoritinoid muscle, is the one that opens the larynx. And I've implied with this drawing that if all the fibers are intact, they're all the same color, they've come from the, shall we say, PCA part of the brain, and they're going to the PCA muscle. And then I've labeled the other two branches of this recurrent laryngeal nerve with different colors, implying again that the LCA fibers in the brain go to the LCA muscle, the TA fibers in the brain or thyroid fibers go to the TA muscle. So when they're all intact, we have this three color bundle. So here we have our intact recurrent laryngeal nerve with all the nerve fibers going the right way. And we can imagine that if there was a paralysis, that the nerve would have been completely cut and there is now no connection between the brain and the muscle. We could represent a paresis as some of the fibers have been injured, they're no longer functioning, we have fewer fibers going to the muscle, so it's weak. And this can happen to varying degrees, mild, moderate, severe. Or it could be that the nerve was pinched and only one branch was injured while the others are functioning normally. So if you're seeing someone very early on after an injury, let's say less than two weeks or two to four weeks, you're only considering the degree of injury, paralysis or paresis. It becomes more complicated when you start to see someone after that period of time because now there's recovery starting and the 10th cranial nerve is really good at regrowing. It, I would guess that more than 80% of the time it regrows in some manner to hook back up to the muscles. So if it doesn't regrow at all, you still have paralysis. This is pretty unusual because the nerve's so good at regrowing. If you have a paresis and it regrows, you begin to get some recovery. And in cases of mild injury, recovery is often complete and normal, meaning that the fibers grow back to the original muscle, restoring normal function. In cases of more severe injury, regrowth may be mixed. Some of the axons may cross over into other bundles. And if it happens to be relatively balanced, we would call this synkinesis. In other cases of severe injury, regrowth may be imbalanced in some way. I can't diagram all the ways, but to give you some ideas, it may be imbalanced in a way that makes the vocal cord tend to move more medially or more laterally or move at the wrong time. As an examiner, you basically have five tools. One is an endoscope. That's a flexible device that goes through the nose and can watch the vocal cords in motion. The second tool is a recorder to record what happens too fast for you to see. And by recording it, you can look at it over and over again and you can look at it in slow motion. So endoscope and recorder. And then the third tool you have is medication, specifically lidocaine. By anesthetizing the larynx, you can put that endoscope much closer to the action than someone who doesn't use it. So those are the three tools that you can buy that will give you a great neurologic exam. But to truly use those, two, two, those three tools well, you need two other tools and they're located up here. And that is to get very, very close to the vocal cords because then you'll see more detail, both about structure and motion. And the second tool is to elicit from your patient or the person you're examining different vocal activities because our vocal cords are very athletic. They can make sound softly. They can make sound loudly. Hey, 
They can make sound at low pitch, e. They can make sound at high pitch, e. And different muscles are being used for each of those. But besides making sound, the larynx also is a valve that opens for breathing. So you also need to manipulate breathing and you can do that by having a person breathe slowly and watch inspiration and expiration. And then you can trigger very active inspiration through a sniff and you trigger all of these different motions. So you manipulate the larynx by eliciting different activities from the person you're examining. There are a number of different types of neurologic finding. There's normal function, and there's complete lack of innervation. The nerve has been cut. The muscle has zero activity. There's paresis, where the nerve has started to grow back and the muscle has some, but not complete activity. And then there are states of dysfunction that we could call synkinesis or dyskinesis. What those conditions represent is a nerve that grew back to a different muscle than it originally innervated. And that can cause motion of the vocal cords in the wrong direction or in a direction at the wrong time. For example, when we talk, we have to bring the vocal cords together. And if one of the nerves has crossed over and one side comes together, but the other side gets further away, we don't have good function. And that would be dyskinesis. The, the muscle that should be relaxed is being activated. And synkinesis is when nerves have crossed over essentially 50-50, and now you have a vocal cord that doesn't move. And it doesn't move because it's not innervated. It is innervated, but it doesn't effectively move because opposing muscles are being fired at the same time, resulting in a net of no motion. But that can provide tension, and sometimes tension is beneficial. So that can be confusing. There are other neurologic findings. There's tremor, which is the regular activation of opposing muscles. And people often are familiar with tremor in the hand, tremor in the voice of a <laughs> a regular alteration of opening and closing muscles. Spasm is similar to tremor. It's a firing of the muscle um, intermittently when it shouldn't be fired, but it happens irregularly and it results either a catch in the voice or a catch in the breathing because a muscle fiber fires, a nerve fires to a muscle when the muscle should be in a stable state and it causes the muscle to move. Then there are conditions that mimic neurologic dysfunction, specifically joint fixation. When a joint is fixed, and a nerve fires, the muscle can't effectively move. And so fixation is really in the realm of neurolaryngology in that it mimics a paralysis or a paresis. In this introduction, I'm going to cover a lot of definitions in order to lay a foundation for what we'll see later on. And the foundation for visual neurolaryngology is that each muscle only has a single action. If I contract my biceps, it can only do one thing and that's contract. Now, it may look really complex what's happening in my hand and wrist because other muscles are contracting at the same time, but technically if we only watch the biceps, it's either relaxed or it's contracting. And it has only one motion, which is to contract and pull. So that applies to the larynx. Each of the many muscles in the larynx can only do one thing. They can only contract. The second foundation for being able to see it 
is that you can elicit it. You can get an individual to do something. So if you want to examine a muscle that closes the larynx, you elicit sound, E, which requires closure of the larynx. If you want to see the larynx open, you elicit breathing in because that activates a different muscle. So each muscle can only contract and you can elicit that contraction by knowing what the muscle is supposed to do. And the third part of it is you can isolate that muscle. That's a little more difficult, but the recording helps you because if you record a person's larynx during an activity like sniffing, it might seem like a lot's going on, but you can focus your eyes on the arytenoid joint and see exactly when the posterior cricorytenoid muscle moves that joint in the direction that you expect it to go. So each muscle can only do one thing, contract. You can isolate the function and elicit it. And you isolate the visualization by recording it and focusing your eye on what you expect to move when you expect to see it move. This leads on to the second foundation of visual neurolaryngology, which is timing of muscle contraction. Each muscle has a particular time when it should contract. Again, when I talk, the thyroid muscle should contract to tighten the vocal cord. And when I breathe, the posterior cricorytenoid muscle should contract to open the larynx. So we'll compare the timing with what we expect to see, but we have another valuable addition in the larynx, and that is that both sides have essentially symmetric function. So we can also compare contraction between the two sides to see if they are symmetric. And if we see movement when we don't expect it, we know that a nerve fiber has regenerated and gone to a different muscle than it originally went to. One of the oddest parts of laryngology and neurolaryngology in particular is that a patient will come to you with a problem, but unconsciously the patient never wants to sound bad. And so they have this problem but when you go to examine them, they try to sound as good as possible. They, I think, sometimes think, I don't want this doctor to think uh, I'm not good enough to sing or make a note or make a sound. And so the patient always compensates. I mean, it happens immediately. If you injure a nerve, immediately the other side will contract harder. And it's not that you've consciously said, contract my uninjured, right side more because my left side isn't working. It's that when we don't get a sound, whatever we do that makes the sound, we just go ahead and compensate. But when a person comes to you and wants to find out the problem, you have to remove that compensation in order to see the problem clearly. So in a way, you have to trick your patient into sounding bad. You have to give them permission to sound bad and it's not a problem. It's not that they are bad. It's not that they don't know how to make the sound. It's that you want to remove the intrinsic compensation that happens naturally in order to identify the underlying problem. In neurolaryngology, we have the vagus nerve coming out of the base of the skull, going down in the neck, coming around either the heart or the subclavian vein, and coming back to the larynx. And, and during that uh, pathway, there are three branches that we can visualize that are of interest to us. The pharyngeal branch, which supplies muscles to the part of the palate, that is lifting the palate up, and squeezing the throat or the pharynx. So those are the upper branches. The next branch that comes off is the superior laryngeal nerve, which goes to one muscle, the cricothyroid muscle, the muscle that takes us up into 
falsetto. And then the recurrent laryngeal nerve supplies three muscles. Thyroritinoid, that is the muscle in the vocal cord itself. Lateral cricorytinoid, the muscle that moves the vocal process to the midline. The posterior cricorytinoid muscle, the muscle that moves the vocal process away from the midline. And then lastly, the interritinoid muscle that stabilizes and holds the vocal cords together after they've been put in that position. Now that's the 10th cranial nerve, but the 10th cranial nerve comes out of a hole at the base of the skull along with two other nerves. The 10th, 11th, and 12th are all bundled together when they come out this foramen or hole. And so tumors or injuries that occur right at the skull base can it typically injure all three nerves at once. So there's two other general structures for the neurolaryngologist to examine whenever there's suspicion of a nerve injury. Nerves 10, 11, and 12, I just told you what 10 does. 11 elevates the shoulder, so the neurolaryngologist will want to see if an individual can lift the shoulder and can raise their arm above the level of their shoulder. Uh, that's the 11th nerve. And the 12th nerve runs the tongue, so a good laryngologist will also be looking inside at what the tongue can do or not do, whether or not the muscle is atrophic or fasciculating or having other problems. So that's the adjacent nerve. Having examined the adjacent nerves, it's time now to put the endoscope in the nose and start the neurologic exam on the interior of the body. And the first thing we'll come to is the soft palate. And we can check whether or not the levator, the elevation of the palate is working by having the individual say plosives, pa, ta, ka, pa, 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 or what are known as fricatives, shh, because in order to make air come out the mouth, we have to seal the back of the nose. If the upper branch is working, the pharyngeal branch is working, then the palate should elevate symmetrically and completely seal the back of the nose during that testing. The second branch that innervates the pharynx works on the pharyngeal constrictor muscles. A good way to examine them is to ask an individual to go up to high pitch, or and as the pitch is raised, the pharynx should be narrowing. This helps for your ear, it helps with the quality of the resonance of the voice and what the neurolaryngologist is looking for is whether or not one or both sides of the pharynx can squeeze simultaneously during the task of making a high pitch. Whew, that's a lot to think about and a lot to examine even before getting to the vocal cords. But by doing all of that first and having all of that in your mind before getting to the vocal cords, you'll tend not to miss these important findings. In summary, visual neurolaryngology is about using endoscopic equipment to examine the larynx and sort out what is going on with the nerves by watching the muscles. And that is differentiating central nerve problems from peripheral problems, peripheral problems from normal motion, and things that mimic or fix the vocal cords and appear to be neurologic but are not. Using an endoscope, we can infer what type of nerve injury has occurred, that is how extensive is it, and which branches of the nerve have been injured. Somewhat more complex, we can sort out recovery of the nerve and infer what branches of the nerve have gone to which muscles. And we do that by eliciting the movement and looking closely, recording it, and going over it in detail. I'm Dr. James Thomas. Thanks for listening in on visual neurolaryngology. I'll have a link to my website, voicedoctor.net, where you can download a PDF file or a booklet on neurolaryngology that will complement this introductory course. 
and there are more videos coming on each of the individual muscles so you can sort out what's going on in the larynx when there's been a nerve injury. Thanks again.